and stations now the final time check before the start of hour number one of the line of fire with dr michael brown 30 seconds until hour number one from mark that was our final verbal time check for the line of fire with dr michael brown we'll have a long tone at 10 seconds before followed by a short one at five seconds have a great afternoon everybody Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. What can we learn from it as believers today? It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. There is no cha sound. Ch ch in, in in Hebrew, there is ch. There's no ch. So this is not the festival of lights, Chanukah. No, it is Hanukkah. Yeah, we're gonna get some practical lessons. We're gonna look at some fascinating things in the history of this feast of dedication, this festival of dedication, Hanukkah, and with with specific application to our situation today how this applies to us as believers today. This is Michael Brown. Welcome to our Thoroughly Jewish Thursday broadcast. Now, we were into the beginning of Hanukkah last week, and because we had pre-recorded that broadcast when I was away for, for that prayer retreat, I just failed to think ahead and realize it would be airing right during Hanukkah. So we want to revisit now as we're at the end of the Hanukkah season, the eight days, the Festival of Lights, which is mentioned in the New Testament in John the 10th chapter, we want to draw some practical lessons, some practical, inspiring application. But today, as always, on Thoroughly Jewish Thursday, we take your calls. So any question of any kind, as long as it is Jewish-related, Israel-related, Hebrew-related, your calls are welcome, 866-348-7884. 49 years ago today, by the mercy and grace of God, I surrendered to the Lord. I had believed for about five weeks, starting November 12th of, of 71, by God's miraculous intervention in my life. I had believed that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead, but I stubbornly refused to repent. I, I knew God was real. I knew the way I was living was wrong, but it was shooting heroin one day, going to church the next, getting high all day one day, going to church the next, back and forth, back and forth a battle for my soul. On December 17th of 71, I couldn't wait to get to the service that night. I had started to make some decisions in the days leading up to it to really push away the drug domination in my life and, and make decisions to put God first, 16 and a half years old, and got to the service that night. And as we we're singing the little ditty hymns, maybe 40 or 50 people there, uh, P pastor's wife playing piano and singing these hymns, I became so overwhelmed by the joy of the Lord. I mean, an experience I had never had, a, a level of joy that was ecstatic, that was different than any drug high, different than a sports high, different than a friendship high, different than a doing good high, whatever experiences I'd had, I realized this was qualitatively different. And I said to myself, this must be what they call the joy of the Lord, because the church talked about that a lot. And we sang about it. I thought, this must be what they call the joy of the Lord. And at that moment, I got a revelation of my sin. I saw myself as filthy from head to toe, filthy from head to toe, and you know, grimy and dirty, filthy because of my sin. And I saw the blood of Jesus washing me clean. That was the forgiveness that God had purchased for me. And, and, put, and, and I saw it in my mind's eye, clear as day, and these beautiful white robes put on me, and I was going back out and playing in the mud. And, and, and the big thing that God was dealing with me about was the needle. That was the real addiction. Yeah, I, I did drugs heavily, but I wasn't addicted to a specific drug. But the needle was the, the thing that to, to say, I'll never put a needle in my life, in my arm again. That is what I knew God was calling me to surrender. And that night, 
as I realized the depth of God's love for me, and he had been heavily convicting me of sin for, for weeks leading up to this, convicting me of the wrongness of my lifestyle. I mean, it got under my skin. I was wrong, guilty, but I couldn't, didn't know how to get away from it, what was going on. And that night when I said, Lord, I'll never put a needle in my arm again. At that moment, all the guilt disappeared. At that moment, the bondage was broken. Went home with my friends, took all my, my needles and drug paraphernalia, threw it over a bridge. Just I remember thinking, if we get caught by police walking to the bridge, you know, what are you doing with needles and cocaine? It's like I'm throwing it away off us. Right. But we, we risked it. It's a few blocks, get to the bridge, tossed it over. And uh, yeah, maybe it littered. Maybe that was litter. Anyway, wanted to get rid of it. And um, two days later, got convicted, you know, shouldn't get high in any way. That was it. What a journey. What an amazing journey. What amazing grace. All right. So before we get to your calls, Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication, what goes on? What, what's the history? What's the background? Uh, let me take you over to the Jewish History website, jewishhistory.org, and, and, and run through a few things, the most salient details that would be really helpful to know and understand. So you remember we're talking about the, the mid second century BC, the 160s, okay? So Jewish history website says that Hanukkah was a miraculous military victory, but a tiny cruise of oil pr proved more miraculous and enduring in the memory of the Jewish people, hence the lighting of the Hanukkah candles for the eight days of Hanukkah. By the way, if, if you have uh, what's called a Hanukkah in your home, many re people refer to it as menorah. Menorah is really the 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 seven branched candlestick in the in the temple. The Hanukkah is is nine branches, the eight days of Hanukkah, and then the one that's called the Shamash that that lights the others. So uh, Jewish history website tells us in the wake of Alexander's appearance in and departure from Jerusalem. So Alexander the Great, great triumph and relation, you know, Jews practicing the religion in in the the Alexandrian Empire. In the wake of Alexander's appearance in and departure from Jerusalem, the relations between Jews and Greeks were so good that an exchange of cultures took place. Each influenced the other. For the Jewish minority, however, what began as a small undertow of assimilation, such as giving children Greek names and speaking the Greek language, became a surprisingly powerful, high-speed, rip-current threatening to drag the cut-off-guard Jews out to the sea of complete assimilation. All right? So... What happens is, and what will culminate in the 160s, this is an earlier period, is that, you know, the world, it's sophisticated and mm, appealing and a little taste here, a little taste there. Before you know it, you're swallowed up by the world. It's interesting that the world generally doesn't look at the church and say, oh, they are so cool. I want to be cool like them. But the church looks at the world and says, oh, the world is so cool. I want to be cool like them. People come to, to, to meet the Lord because they realize something's wrong and they need God. And we have God, but they don't come to us because we're cool. All right, so Jews who embraced Greek culture at the expense of Judaism became known as, as Mishanim or Hellenists. Estimates are that a third or more, uh, Mishavnim, right? So, so from, from the, the word for Greek, um, estimates that a third or more of the Jewish population was Hellenist, including those who reversed their circumcision. What? Reversed their circumcision, yes. Why? It's painful enough to be circumcised. Reverse the circumcision? Literally with a surgery? Yes. Why? Because things like Olympic-type games were conducted in the nude. So if you're a male and you want to play in the games, it, well, you, is, is, you want everyone to know you're a Jew? You're circumcised? You're one of them? So you have to assimilate. Now, what, how do we do it? In what ways do we assimilate? In what ways do we kind of suppress our believing identity, our identity in Jesus to be more like the world? Doesn't Paul say that the reason that some Jewish believers in the first century were preaching circumcision, telling the Gentiles you have to be circumcised, was to avoid the reproach of the cross? So in Jewish circles, the cross brought one reproach, and then in Hellenistic circles, being a Jew brought reproach. So... They reversed their circumcision. They ate pork. They went out of the way to show we're just like the world. Bowed to idols. And then became self-hating enough 
to side with the enemies of Israel. Hellenism threatened to annihilate the Jewish world through assimilation in ways tyrants tried but could not do by force. Had the situation continued as it was, the Greeks would perhaps have won the battle by default. However, they overstepped themselves, as often happens, and then God's people wake up. By the way, in America today, the greatest threat to the future of the Jewish people is assimilation. Assimilation. At the beginning of the year 190 BCE, so before the Common Era, the situation between the two great post-Alexandrian empires, the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic, deteriorated badly. The Seleucids mounted an invasion that took their army through the land of Israel, which is sandwiched in between. Whenever a foreign army comes into a country, it changes the view of the populace. Instead of an attractive culture, the Greeks were now an occupying enemy. Instead of something to be imitated, they now became something to be resisted. Ah, make application in our society. When those that, oh, it's appealing in the world, now the world starts to take over. Now it's something to be resisted. The Jewish people are very stubborn. The same person who is so stubborn that he will not observe the Torah and freedom will observe it with passion if forbidden from observing it. He becomes stubborn the other way. All right, skip down. Uh, the Greek army exerted a very heavy hand against the Jews. First, they forced Jews to finance their war through collection of taxes. Then they forced them to quarter their soldiers in Jewish homes. Finally, the Greeks were determined to crush the Jewish religion. First, they took the statue of Zeus and mounted it in the courtyard of the temple. Next, the Greeks banned the observance of the Sabbath on the pain of death. Then the Talmud, Subot 3b, records there was a period of time which lasted a number of decades when the Greek officer in town had the right to, quote, live with a woman on her wedding night before her husband-to-be. The Greeks also banned circumcision. Whoever circumcised his child was put to death. Both child and father were killed. The Greeks demanded that altars to the Greek idols be established and that sacrifices be offered on a regular basis in every Jewish town. Finally, the Jewish educational system was entirely erupted and about... The year 166 BCE, a group finally stood up to the Greeks, Matis Yahu and his family, known as the Hasmoneans. We do not know, and uh, ultimately the Maccabees. We do not know much about them except that they were of noble descent from the priestly class, including those who had served as high priests. They lived in a small town called Modin, which is about 12 miles northwest from Jerusalem. One day, a Greek contingent marched in, set up an altar, gathered all the Jews, forced them to sacrifice a pig to Zeus. Then they asked for a Jewish volunteer to perform the sacrifice one step forward, as he approached the altar, Matisha, who stabbed him to death, chaos broke out. The Greek army attempted to subdue the crowd, but the Jews were armed and slaughtered the entire Greek patrol. There was no turning back now. Matisha, who had five sons, all of whom were people of great organizational leadership, as well as pious, committed Jews. And this is how it goes. They organize a force of 3,000 men, then it grows to 6,000, never reach more than 12,000 men. Many of these men paid with their death. This is what brought about the liberation of the Jewish people and the rededication of the temple and the miraculous cruise of oil being preserved for eight days until more oil came. It's a lesson for today against assimilation to the world and a call of courage. Oh, not a violent uprising, but a courageous pushback against the culture of the day. Some lessons to learn, no? We'll be right back. There's a very interesting verse in the book of Revelation in the third chapter. As Jesus is speaking to one of the churches in Asia Minor, Revelation chapter 3, he gives this promise. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So that leads to the question, is it possible to have your name blotted out of the book of life? Is it possible to be a believer and have your name blotted out? I say yes. As I understand scripture, we can choose to walk away from God. We can choose to forfeit eternal life. We can choose to forfeit our status as sons and daughters of God. We can choose to leave his household and his family and reject him as Lord. Now, I want to be perfectly clear. He has promised to keep us safe to the end. No one can pluck us out of his hand. 
Nothing can separate us from his love. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He does not write our name in the Lamb's Book of Life in pencil. And when we do good, he writes it a little stronger. When we do bad, he erases half of it. And I'm saved one day and lost the next. And saved one minute, lost the next. That's unscriptural. That's no way to live. That's contrary to what scripture says. We need to rest in his promises, rest in his goodness, rest in the assurance that he will keep us strong to the end that he will finish what he started. I believe that. I believe that he has the power to keep everything I've entrusted to him until that day. At the same time, the many warnings through the New Testament I take with utmost seriousness from Paul, from Peter, from John, from others, I take with the utmost seriousness that we can turn away from the Lord, in which case he would blot our name out of the book of life. May it never happen to you. May it never happen to me. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Beautiful, ultra-Orthodox Jewish voices singing the Psalms. The one who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Let us pray for our friends in the Jewish community. All right, we go to the phone starting in Cleveland, Ohio. Gavin, welcome to the Line of Fire. Hey, Michael, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Hey, I got some more uh, fun Targum questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so clearly in Isaiah 9, they mentioned the Messiah by, by name. Um, but there's a, there's a kind of a, a different insertion uh, by the Targumist, and he says before he mentioned for us uh, a child is born, a son is given, he inserts the prophet said to the house of David. And I'm wondering, do you think that in a way calls back to Isaiah 7? Because um, in Isaiah 10, he inserts the prophet, and again there it talks about the house of David and then obviously the son. Right, so, here's, so for, for those uh, listening, to explain the question here, the Targum is the ancient Aramaic translation slash paraphrase of the Hebrew Bible. It, it arises as an oral tradition in the synagogue in places where Hebrew was not understood as well, and Aramaic became the, the normal language, the lingua franca that was, that was spoken among the people. So traditions would develop in the synagogue as the Hebrew was read, then afterwards, the, the Aramaic paraphrase would be given, or translation. It, it gets looser as time goes on. And eventually, these things are written down. And if you have what's called a rabbinic Bible today, Mikraot Kedolot, which is multi-volume, Mikraot Kedolot means big scriptures, you'll see on the, on the top of the page, the biggest print is the text of the Hebrew Bible. Then next to that, the Targum, the Aramaic. And then beneath that, in smaller print, the rabbinic commentaries. So Targums are, are read as, as sacred literature, not inspired on the same level as Scripture, but it does shape a lot of interpretation. So the question is, why would the Targum add in uh, that this is what's being said to the house of David, and then it does specifically mention the birth of the Messiah? It, it interprets the passage overall differently, attributing most of the names to God, uh, like God the Mighty One, etc., will call his name Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace, but otherwise it recognizes it as a Messianic prophecy. So the, the way that I would then check to see if, in fact, uh, this was a, a, an insertion of great importance, why does it say the house of David there, which is what we have twice in, in Isaiah, the seventh chapter, and that's, an, that's not a common phrase in the book of Isaiah, uh, is it tying in with Isaiah 7? I, I would, number one, say I strongly doubt it, simply because there is no ancient Jewish tradition that we have that identifies Isaiah 7 as a messianic prophecy. However, the simple way to do it, and, and I'll, I'll do it during the break, is you just do a search in Targum Jonathan for House of David in Isaiah, and you see where else he puts it and how often he puts it, and is there any significance to it. So it, it's, it's a, an Actually, excellent question. In other words, it makes perfect sense because that's where you have it in this context of Isaiah 7 through 11 
We only have House of David mentioned there twice right. in Isaiah 7 and not elsewhere uh, in this. Um, but other, otherwise, it's clearly a, a word to the Davidic dynasty in Isaiah 9. I mean, that's the obvious logic behind it. Uh, did, were you able to do a search for it or, or no? Oh, yeah. My wife is going to kill me with how much I spent on these uh, <laughs> podcast programs. But anyway, yeah. So Isaiah 7 2, Isaiah 7 13, Isaiah 8 6, Isaiah 9 6, and Isaiah uh, 22 22. So it's basically in that cluster and then 22 22. Well, 22 22 is in the Hebrew, correct? And the other two in Isaiah 7 are in the Hebrew. Off the top of my head, the you're, it's Isaiah 8, which is not in the Hebrew, House of David, right. and Isaiah 9. Those are the two. Because the other is the, the two in Isaiah right. 7, and then, right, in 22, those are the House of David passages in Isaiah. Yeah, so the question is, why is it inserted there in Isaiah 8? It, it, let's just say this, though, okay? Regardless of why, it does bring a continuity in the chapters. Uh, and then, of course, right. Isaiah 11, quite blatantly, about the Messiah, son of David, is identified as you know, the root from Jesse. So I have argued that when Matthew quotes it in Matthew 1, when he quotes Isaiah 7, 14, that he has in mind Isaiah 7 through 11. And we see references to it uh, in, a, in a hidden way in the second chapter and a more overt way in the fourth chapter of Matthew. So at the very least, uh, if you were reading this through, right, as a, as a reader reading the Targum, you would see this theme, House of David, House of David, House of David, House of David, four times, twice in the seventh chapter, once in the eighth, once in the ninth. And that would bring a sense of continuity. Uh, but has anyone, you know what? Do you have Bruce Chilton's book on, on the, the Targum, uh, Isaiah Targum? No. Uh -uh. All right. Well, tell you what, I will. I, I own, he's got a couple of books about it. I'll see if he makes anything out of that. Uh, but that's very interesting. Okay. So I, I appreciate the question. And uh, you did your homework. Now I'll do a little more of mine. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Sure thing. And, and tell your wife it's, a, right, good, it's a good expense. If, I know, I if know. she asks when is it going to end, say actually it, it really does it. It's kind of like an obsession. But yeah. anyway, but basic yeah, tools yeah. though you can get a good <laughs> some basic software tools and then then you're set for a while. All right, thank you for the call eight six six three four truth. Let's go over to Sims in McAllen, Texas. Welcome to the line of fire. Uh, thank you, Doctor Brown. Thank you again for taking my call. Uh, I got an interesting question from my uh, wife a few days ago relating to uh, Daniel 7. At first I thought, you know, she just wanted to understand the chronology of the 70 weeks because that's what she seemed to be re referring to. But her question, I guess, is a little bit more basic than that and that what she wants to know is why is it that each one of the 70 weeks is being taken as seven years? Like, mm -hmm. um I guess, upon what basis do we have to assume that, you know, each week meant seven years right. in, and, in terms of prophecy? Right. So in Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27, the 70 weeks, why do we just say, with, well, there are certainly years? So I, I love the fact that she asked the question, because many times we just take something for granted. You know, well, there must be a reason, because that's how we all interpret it. And then many times when you dig deeper, you think, oh, well, there is a reason or there isn't a reason. So here are the, the reasons that it's taken to be periods of years. Uh, number one is that Daniel is praying about the 70 years in exile. And if you remember, 70 years in exile, God had said that there would be uh, one year for, for every, every Sabbath year that had been neglected. In other words, there's going to be the, the 70 years stood for 490 years, where every seven years they neglected the annual Sabbath, etc. The Sabbath of the land wasn't kept, so now it was going to rest for 70 straight years. So it was making up for Israel's sin over a period of 490 years. That's the first thing. So the 70 years that Daniel's praying about, if you read, for example, in Second Chronicles uh, uh, 36, and, and then even the, the curses in Leviticus 26, but especially Second Chronicles 36, You'll get that understanding. So that's number one, that the 70 years in exile were for 490 years of neglecting the seventh year Sabbath every year for seven, uh, for 490 years. That's number one. Number two, it doesn't use the normal word for week, but rather for seven. So it's saying 70 sevens, not just 70 weeks, 70 sevens, making that 
uh, even clearer. Uh, the third thing is what is being described could not happen in a period of 490 days. The rebuilding of the temple and the city and, and all of the events that are going to transpire could not happen in that short a period of time. So that's the, the next reason that we take it to mean years. And then in Daniel, the 10th chapter, Daniel talks about uh, going on a particular fast for three weeks of days. He seems to specify, I'm talking about regular weeks again. So it's putting those things together. The 70 years had to do with a period of disobedience for 490 years. The nature of the events that took place could not happen in a shorter period of time of, of just regular weeks. And then Daniel speaking of, of weeks, of days immediately after that. So the logical understanding then is rather than weeks of days, there are weeks or of years or septads of years. And then when you look at what ultimately unfolds over that period of time, right? What, when you look at what transpires, it now, it now works because it's, it's from the rebuilding of the city and the temple to the time of the destruction of the temple. And, and you look at that period of time, it, it's hard to know exactly where it starts. But you think, okay, you're, you're dealing with like roughly 500 year period there. So it unfolds and it makes sense. So that's the reasoning behind it. It's clearly deduced from the text although not absolutely explicit, all right? All right, uh, much appreciated. When she first asked me the question, my first thought was to go to volume three of Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, but uh, then she hit me with, okay, why is it weak? That was her question. So yeah, that, and that's, that's very much helpful. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and, and I love the fact you're studying Scripture together. And you, you went to the right place, volume three of Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, where we deal with, Object, Jewish, Jewish objections to Messianic prophecy, and of course I have a whole section on Daniel 9, 24 to 27, but because that's not a real Jewish objection, in other words, traditional Jews accept that this, these are 70 weeks of years as well, for the most part, as do Christian scholars, so that didn't come up. So great, we got to cover that as well. All right, we come back, let's see. Our friend Manny in Brooklyn, you're next. We come back. Hey, everybody, my book, Resurrection. Investigating a rabbi from Brooklyn, a preacher from Galilee, an event that changed the world. I just discovered last night it's on sale on Kindle. So an ebook and get the Kindle app for any any system you have or any smartphone or tablet. Four ninety nine. Yeah, I mean authors get nothing when this happens. So I'm just I'm just telling you so you can take advantage of it. Resurrection. It's an eye opening book. It looks at false messiahs in Jewish history and how there's only one who really rose. It's it's a fascinating read. And it's super cheap now. So just look for my name, Michael Brown, and Resurrection on Amazon. Get the Kindle version. Cheap. So why does a good God allow evil in the world? I don't just mean suffering, but, but evil. Things that are so ugly, things that are so dark, things that are so despicable, things that are so contrary to goodness, why does God allow them in his world? And the answer is simple. And that answer is choice. That answer is freedom. He has given us a choice. He has put us in an environment where we can choose good, we can refuse evil. God could have created Adam and Eve and given us no choice. He put them in a beautiful, perfect world and said, you can obey and be blessed or you can disobey and be cursed. He gave a choice because love cannot be coerced. And if I said to each of you, I can do an operation on your brain, you'll no longer be able to make choices, but you'll be trouble free the rest of your life. Would you take that or would you say, no, I'd rather be able to make choices choices. Here's what God said to the people of Israel. Moses gave this challenge in Deuteronomy 30 verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore choose life that you and your offspring may live. He gives us a choice and says you determine whether it will be blessing or curse, whether it will be life, whether it will be death. And even in this world where there is evil, there is pain, there is hardship. We can learn through it. We can grow through it. Everything that this world means to drag us down and destroy us can help us draw closer to God. The things that are meant for evil can be turned for good. 
Often it's through suffering and pain that we grow closer to the Lord. Often it's by seeing evil that we determine all the more to do good and be vessels of good. So even the evil can be used for good purposes. And then having made our choice, having cast our lot, having said, Lord, we want you and we don't want the evil, the day will come when Jesus will return, when we will be resurrected, when we will be with him forever, and when we will be in a perfect world where there is no sin, there is no evil, there is no pain, there is no death, and God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. That day will come. But right now, we're in a world with darkness and light, with blessing and curse, with good and evil. We make choices, and even when evil comes to our door, it can be turned around as an opportunity for greater good. Our God is a Redeemer. Hey friends, many more resources waiting for you on our website, askdrbrown.org. I look forward to being with you there. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome to the Line of Fire. It is thoroughly Jewish Thursday and up. There we go. Some other music coming in, but it is Line of Fire. It is Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. This is Michael Brown. Delighted to be with you. How I love taking your questions, interacting, and studying, learning, diving in together. Uh, I'm a lifelong pursuer of truth. Love the truth. The truth, Jesus said, sets us free, especially when it's divine truth. 866-34-TRUTH is the number to call. And it's our friend Manny in Brooklyn. So nice to hear from you again. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach, Dr. Brown. So what's on your mind today? Um, I thought I'd challenge you on your views on Haggai, the second chapter. Um, that the glory of the you know, second temple will be greater than the first. Uh, your interpretation is that the second temple's glory is the Messiah coming to it. As yes. opposed to uh, perhaps a physical... Um, Right. So how, okay. how about if I read the text for everybody, okay? Sure. And then, then sure. you can uh, challenge my view on it. So Haggai, the second chapter, just a, a little book in the Bible with a powerful message. And um, Haggai's encouraging them to rebuild the second temple. And we'll start in verse 6. For thus said, And I'm reading from the New JPS version. For thus said the Lord of hosts, in just a little while longer, I'll shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I'll shake all the nations and the precious things of all the nations shall come here. And I will fill this house with glory, said the Lord of hosts. Silver is mine, gold is mine, says the Lord. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former one, said the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will grant prosperity or grant peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So my understanding is that yes, silver and gold come to beautify the temple especially in the time of, of Herod, but that the glory that's spoken of is the divine glory, and that when that temple was, the second temple was dedicated, it did not, and the Talmud recognizes this, it did not have the divine fire, did not have the Shekhinah, did not have the Ark of the Covenant, Urim and Tumim. So how was the glory of the second temple greater than the glory of the first? My answer is, that the Messiah came in his glory and then sent the Spirit there, uh, poured out his Spirit at that place after his resurrection. That would explain the glory, because with the dedication of the first temple and the tabernacle, the glory of God was there in a manifest way. And rabbinic interpretations would be that it referred to the physical beautifying or perhaps the longer duration of the second temple to the first. So all, all over to you, sir. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned, uh, but I heard you said precious things of the nations. I heard you mentioned silver and gold. Um, that is the clear context of the verse. Any other interpretation you have regarding the Messiah is a personal interpretation or homolytical. It's not, not from the context of the is very clearly it's talking about physical beauty. Uh, well, one other point is that earlier on in the chapter, it, it addresses uh, people who, formerly have seen the first temple in its 
you know, and said, you know, in its glory. And now I don't, I don't think it's talking about the time of Solomon. I think it's probably talking about, you know, in the days of maybe Zachariah or, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, the last king, what's his name, uh, Zedekiah, and and you know his his predecessors before, where there was lots of idolatry involved. So I don't think that it's really talking about uh, you know the uh, spirit. I think it's more talking about the physical properties of a temple. Right, and it does mention its former kavod. So who saw that? So so that's a that's a very good contextual argument. So you have kavod mentioned earlier in the chapter, glory. And who saw the former glory, the glory of the second temple is going to be greater. And then you have specific reference to silver and gold, which is also uh, important. And the, definitely there in the context, definitely the beautifying of the temple. So saying uh, that the glory of the second temple would be greater than the first, you could say it's, it's obviously physical splendor. And then just to clarify one other thing in your argument, and then I, I want to ask you a couple of questions, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, when, when God says... Uh, the glory of this uh, silver is gold. Uh, oh, let me back up. I'll shake all the nations, precious things of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory. Mm-hmm. Um, elsewhere in the Bible, as you know, when God speaks of filling the house with glory or the house being filled with glory, it's always talking about his presence, his glorious presence. Mm-hmm. Why do you think it's different here? Whereas elsewhere, in other words, anytime you have, it's not a common phrase, but the phrase fill with glory or fill with my glory or God's glory, it's always talking about his physical manifest presence as in the, the tabernacle in Exodus 40 or the, the first temple in Second Chronicles 5. Why do you feel free to interpret it differently there? I just First of all, I just want to clarify what you mean by glory. When God fills glory, you're talking about only the temple and tabernacle or you're talking about in general whenever God fills glory over anything? Well, when, when it uses the term that, that he's going to fill a place with, with glory, it's okay. never talking about it's never talking about physical splendor, but rather his presence, his manifest power. Um, well, I, I just say the context. The context is, is talking about phys- physicality, um, physical glory. It's talking about, uh, it seems to me, talking about a political upheaval, because it does talk about that God will shake, you know, the heavens and that. Stuff like that, which lots of times in Scripture refers to political upheaval, like perhaps Isaiah chapter 13. Mm-hmm. But I don't see any reason to limit, because one of the things does is to, like, your your interpretation would limit the time when the Messiah has to come. My interpretation wouldn't limit such a thing. So I'm not looking to limit, you know, uh, uh, certain things in Scripture. So could it be that there was something more spiritual in the temple could be, but that there's no there's no there's no reason to say so unless you're you're doing you know uh, midrashic interpretations and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But those stuff you know you can't really prove it's just personal and either you accept it or you don't. You know? Now, now you would agree that if God was putting a limitation on something in Scripture, that you would accept it. If that was the plain sense, then if God was putting a timetable, right. you'd accept it. If if God was putting it, you don't want me to put yeah, it there yeah. when it's not there. But if God put it there, you accept it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. But in this in this case, it, it seems the context is very clear, talking about silver, gold, and uh, the precious things of nations, which the New Revised Standard Version interprets very plainly the treasures of the nations, which seems to be more of a commentary that, yeah, we're talking about physical stuff. I mean, I see no reason why to interpret it spiritually. Right. So, so uh, do you think you have more insight than the Talmudic rabbis? Uh, maybe, maybe not, especially with regard to uh, chronology. I might have some more insights on that. Oh, okay. So uh, we'll get it. Yeah. So let's, aside from Seder Alam and, and, and those questions and the yeah. chronology, in terms of just general spiritual insight and into the meaning of, of, of Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, do you think you have more insight than the ancient sages, the Tanaim and the Amoraim, et cetera? Um, I don't think I have more in regard to. Uh... I would say the halacha, because they have authority over Jewish law and stuff like that. But I have no problem, uh, you know, disregarding a rabbinic commentary or even the uh, midrashim or the words of Chazal in certain instances if, if there's, you know, very good evidence against it. Okay, so that's that's a whole other subject. You know, you told me that some of your friends think you depend on on Rambam and his rationalism too much. So that yeah. this is this is a bit more extreme. You know, in, in that sense, you're you're less. Uh, uh, 
ultra-Orthodox kosher in that regard. But the reason I asked is because you know that the Talmud tries to figure out the meaning, and there's actually a dispute over this. And the one view is that the second temple stood longer than the first. If it's so obvious, why didn't they all see it? You still there? Okay. Uh, did we just lose Manny? Okay. Manny, if you're there, we didn't cut you off. Uh, let me just, we had a weird thing happen yesterday where we, we lost our, our audio feed from the studio. So guys, uh, go to work on whatever's going on here. So tell you what, Manny, I didn't cut you off. And if you were answering me, and it looked like you had no answer, and I just stumped you or something like that. It was not a setup. It's not a setup to make me look good and make you look bad. Um, so we are we are just going to – I'm going to keep talking. So, Manny, stay there, all right? Stay there uh, while we try to work on this uh, – on the tech side. But uh, what I'm going to do is is explain my reason for not agreeing with Manny here. Okay, and if you're still there, we'll come back to you on the other side of, of the break if we need to. Uh, but we'll we'll try to resolve things on our end. But I want to say again, it looks like I just stumped Manny. I asked a question and there's no answer. It could have been he was pausing for a moment, and at that moment we we lost our our feed. You're still hearing me. But if Manny had no answer, these guys have some extra time to think about it. Okay. But <clears throat> the reason that I don't just accept, well, it's obvious. The context talks about the former glory, the former kavod. Now it says the second temple will have greater kavod than the first. You saw the earlier kavod. Well, the people that were there, the old people that had seen the first temple, Solomon's temple and all of its glory and splendor, right? They, they didn't see it when it was dedicated and the fire of the Lord consumed the sacrifices. They didn't see it when it was dedicated and the glory of the Lord filled the sanctuary so the priest couldn't even enter and minister. So what they saw was the physical building in its physical covenant, its physical splendor. The second temple was the shell of it. And God said, no, I'm going to shake the nations. The silver and gold are going to come. And the glory, the covenant, say splendor of this second temple will be greater than the first. So it's just Herod's beautifying of it later on. That's all it's talking about. Nothing to do with coming of the Messiah. My argument that how could the glory of the second temple be greater than the glory of the first when all these other things were missing? My answer is simple, that God says that he will fill the temple with glory. And in point of fact, that if you look at that phrase specifically in conjunction with the dedication of the tabernacle, and the dedication of Solomon's temple, it refers to the literal manifest presence of God. How on earth, how on earth would God say the glory of the second temple is going to be greater than the first when the presence, the manifest presence of God was not there in any way that compared to the first temple or the tabernacle? In other words, just silver and gold makes the temple glorious? That's where I'd have a difference. All right, hopefully we'll reconnect with Manny and get your other calls on the other side of the break. One of my friends pastors a church that I believe is the most giving church in America in terms of the amount of funds that they donate to missions and, and other causes, maybe the most giving church in the entire world. But he said to me years ago, we do not preach prosperity. We preach generosity. In other words, our emphasis is on giving. Our emphasis is on honoring the Lord by giving. He is a giving God in his love he gives and our love for him and love for others we give. We give to him and we give to meet the needs of a needy world around us. And look at what Paul writes, an amazing principle, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. The point is this. 
Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So here, let's just look at it in financial terms. If I've got a dollar bill in my hand and I'm holding on to it because I need that dollar, I want that dollar, I have to have that dollar. I've got to pay a toll and I need that dollar, right? Well, you can't take it from me. My hand is closed. On the other hand, if it's open, you could take it from me, but if it's open, I can also receive. See, if it's closed, I can't receive. If it's open, I can receive. So if I am open-hearted, if I am generous, if God smiles on me and blesses me, and I think, you know, this person has a need here, I could be generous towards them, then it opens up a, a path and fountain of generosity where God can now entrust more because he knows our heart is not to build our own kingdom or to better ourselves, but to help others. So generosity begets generosity. It's the same with our time. It's the same with our attitudes towards others as we're generous and gracious and kind towards them. It begets that type of response back to us. And as we are generous with our funds for the gospel and to help Help others, it begets a return in that way, which creates a cycle of giving and life and blessing. Theologian Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866 34 Truth. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome back to the line of fire. Hopefully, back with Manny. Are you still there, sir? Yes, I'm here. Ah, okay. So, yeah, so sorry about what happened. This is the uh, second day this week. We had something like this go on. But it sounded mm -hmm. as if I stumped you. I asked the question, and there was, there was nobody I, there. So, uh, well, maybe you did. <laughs> yeah, so, so anyway, you got, you got a little extra time to think about it. Yeah, if it's so clear and you make a good argument for it, right? Mm -hmm. Why do you think in the Talmud there's a debate about it and and other rabbis uh, reject that interpretation? Mm -hmm. So I, the only time I've seen this in the Talmud, and I haven't yet seen everything, um, is in Baba Basra um, 3a. And the context of it, it's talking about the uh, amount of height of, of, a, of, a, of a wall and the necessity of how wide it would have to be in different logistics. And it talks about, you know, the building of the temple in regards to what, you know, Scripture says about, you know, how high the temple was. Mm -hmm. And then it questions, then why in the second temple didn't we have something similar? And one person says, well, the second temple was a little bit larger or, or bigger. And he says, well, how do we know that it was bigger? And, you know, as, as Talmudic rabbis like to do, they like to usually bring the proof from Scripture so one of them brings a proof in scripture that it was higher based on this verse. And I guess the other one didn't agree. And he held that maybe it was the same height. And he therefore had to interpret it differently. But they don't disagree that, uh, and first of all, this is a little bit more midrashic, uh, what the rabbis are saying. The rabbis, are, it's not like Rashi. It's not, not so much a, 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 a commentary. It's more of like a very deductive, you know, much more midrashic style but the simple reading, I don't think any of them would disagree that just in general, the second temple was greater in length and height and, and money and value, you know, like there's other places it says in the Talmud, who, he who has not seen the building of, you know, Herod, hasn't seen a nice building, you know. All right, so like it looks looks like then you've got to invest another book in your library from me, all right? Uh, so... In, in, in volume one of Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, which is very general material, but the, this, the, the, the second half of that deals with historical objections. In Objection 2.1, I take up the issue of peace on earth and the Messiah's coming, etc. And I get into this discussion. Uh, so have you not read the discussion in, in Yoma 21b? As, as we're, because it lists, it, the, the rabbis point out there that there were five items missing from the second temple that were in the first. So why is this right, coming right. up? Because you had divine fire, you had you had God's presence, right? And now you don't have it mm -hmm. in the second temple. That and, and in the first temple, it's associated with His glory. At the tabernacle, it's associated with His glory. So my mm -hmm. question is: Is it now that the glory of God that was so prominent in the first? The temple and the tabernacle and the and the manifest visible presence of God that that now becomes kind of well secondary as long as you have silver and gold 
So the list, right? No. The Shekhinah, the Holy Spirit, Urim oh, yeah. Turim, uh, Divine Fire, and a mercy seat, the Ark with the Mercy Seat and Cherubim, all missing. So silver and gold make up for that? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, it could be. Maybe that's what the, the uh, rabbis thought in Yuma. I haven't seen the, the passage in Yuma. But um, what, 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 what the passage, it's not talking about people who witnessed the first temple in the days of Solomon. It's talking no. about people who witnessed right, the right. temple in the, in the end of times. And I don't have a source for this, but I highly doubt that the Shekhinah was fully there. Uh, when people were offering, you know, sacrifices by no, idolatry no. during that time, I think it was like halfway out. No, but the, no, the whole point is, and and um, if, if you don't mind, well, I'll send you another book. How's mm-hmm. that? And uh, you can look at the relevant parts. By the way, I have a friend who's a former Haredi, ultra orthodox Jew, who's a follower of Yeshua, and he was mm-hmm. listening to our conversation, uh, the call last time about God's triunity, etc. And um, I, I wonder if you, uh, if you might ever want to interact privately. You know, he's a very private person, as 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 uh, you know, you would be in terms of these issues. But um, maybe one day there's a way to put you in correspondence. But listen, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you uh, the first volume of of answering Jewish objections to Jesus, volume one. So we we did send you something previously. We should have your your address. But Rachel, get it to be sure because I, I said we're not putting you on a list or anything like that. And then look at my argument, look at the rabbinic sources, but in particular, look at the Hebrew, because my, my point is when God says, I will fill this with glory, it's very specific language. So yes, silver and gold. Yes, shaking of the nations. Yes, abundance coming in. Yes, beautifying the temple. Absolutely yes to all of that, but there must be something more because filling with glory is remember this is a, a very specific time frame. It's the time of the dedication of the temple, right? What happened when Solomon dedicated his temple and the words fill with glory were used? Very specific. When Moses dedicated the tabernacle, fill with glory. What happened? Something very specific to use those same words now with a totally different meaning. Now, to me, that's midrashic rather than saying, how is this word used? What would it have meant to the people then? So I'm saying both and. Yes, a physical beautifying, but there had to be something more. Hey, thank you for the call. God willing, we will we will keep the dialogue going. All right, let us go to Saul in Roseville, California. Thanks for holding. Welcome to the line of fire. Shalom, Dr. Brown. Shalom. Hi. So uh, I just have a question about uh, uh, Luke ch- chapter 9, verses 19. And I've heard many Christian uh, teachers teach that uh, Gilgal Neshemot, the reincarnation, is not found in the Bible, and that ancient rabbis didn't need to teach it. And so my question to you is either maybe you, you, you haven't, I'm guessing you've studied you know, Simon Bar Yochai and Maimonides and all the, many of the Jewish rabbis who, who teach Gilgal Neshemot, um, and and. And the, and, the, and the question is... Where is, does, where does is, Shimon Bar Yochai teach it? In the, in the Zohar. Ah, but, that's, he was, but he, uh, he didn't he write was, the Zohar. That's a mythical attribution. He, he's early 2nd well, century, he the, and the, the, the Zohar is a 13th century uh, production. So it's, it's, it's mythically attributed to him. But there's not a stitch of historical evidence that he is the author of the Zohar. No, he's not the author. His teachings were transposed through the Zohar. Through rabbi, through student, and but, but, through right, discipleship, that, that's, just that's a mythical. Uh, through, I mean, we we know who. I mean, wrote you could it, say the same we, thing about the New Testament. I mean, Jesus didn't write anything either. So no, but no, but we, is, but is we that, know we know for sure. Here's the difference: we know for sure that the eyewitnesses who were there with him in their lifetimes wrote down what happened. Versus over a thousand years later, a, a, a whole new theology arises that cannot in any way be traced back to the historical person. I mean, there's no possible way you can make that comparison. Well, so the, so my main question is, is why would a Christian teacher teach that reincarnation was not taught by the Jews if the Jews around Jesus himself all believed he was a reincarnation of a prophet? Well, Everybody knew Jesus had a mom. He mm-hmm. didn't fall out of the sky. Mm-hmm. He, wasn't, he wasn't carried in a chariot. Right, mm-hmm. and so they believe that he was a prophet from old, risen back to life again. 
And the only way they believed that he was risen back to life again was through the womb. And that's because of the ancient Hebrew doctrine of living through your son, living through your seed. But it's not a little right, right, day right. in Genesis. Right. Hey, so let me, let me just ask you one, one quick question first, okay? Uh, yeah. ha, uh, have you called to raise this point before? Yes. Did you call using the same name? Yes. No. My name is Brandon Saul, and I introduced myself as Brandon Saul last time. Oh, uh, okay. Got it. Just, just wondering, um, <laughs> because, very specifically, uh, because I didn't, I would have remembered Saul with this, with this, uh, same point, but uh, here, here's the issue. It wasn't the same question, by all means, but yeah, well, it, was, it was a related question. Right, right. So, are you? Right. Are you? Would you like my my academic answer to your question? Yes. Right. We have some evidence that some Jews in the first century may have believed in some type of reincarnation or something where a, a, someone from a previous generation could be manifest in a later. That's the only hint we have. We have zero hint in any ancient Jewish document outside of that. Zero attestation beyond it. The strongest reference being in the ninth century where the leading rabbinic scholar in Judaism called it complete foolishness and no evidence of this really rising into Lurianic Kabbalah where it really becomes prominent. Are you saying that Moses Maimonides also espoused Gilgul? Uh, yes, he interpreted the book of Job, chapter 33, verses 29 through, well, verses really 20 through 30, but he interpreted Job 33 as uh, reincarnation, yes. Uh, literally as reincarnation. Well, if you read Job 33, Elihu is rebuking Job and his friends for saying that he was sinless and how he was... Uh, no, no, I, I, or, I understand or, or, that. Or that. Yeah, I understand. And and where where so, would you so say Maimonides that? Maimon yeah. interpret and, and where does he do that? So he, if you go to verse twenty nine, right? But, but Maimonides doesn't have a com Maimonides didn't write a commentary on Job. Where are you saying that Maimonides gave that interpretation? So I believe that it was in it's in the Talmud. The Tal um, Ma Maimonides, the exact quote. Maimonides is eleven thirty five to twelve oh four, sir. That's five hundred years after the right, conclusion yeah, of the he, Talmud. He's a, he's a lot. Yeah, he yeah, correct. He studied Kabbalah and all that. Yes, he man. did not. My mom, he was not a Kabbalist. I tell you what, get your evidence in order. Get your evidence in order. Let's get away from myths and fables. We can have a discussion, but you got to get your evidence in order. Because when you present it like this, it, it undercuts the point you're trying to make. All right. God bless, friends. Back with you and your questions tomorrow.